So, first of all, thank you very much for the opportunity to come and speak tonight. Um, my name is David Salgado, as Valeria said, Head of Operations at Materium, and um, I will try and build on what Valeria said about what it is that we do, but I'll do that towards the end of the presentation because it kind of needs a bit of build-up. Um, technical by background, developer, technical architect, uh, been CTO at a couple of startups, and I've been a blockchain enthusiast uh, for a couple of years. So I'm glad that I didn't decide to do the what is a blockchain, um, how it works presentation, because when uh, Henk asked who was at their first blockchain meetup, hardly anybody put their hand up, so we've all seen loads of those. But I would like to spend a little bit of time talking about what makes them special. What are the characteristics of a blockchain? And this isn't a definition. Uh, this is just some of the important features that most blockchains tend to share. And the first uh, is immutability. So a blockchain is a database that has immutable history. Once you've written to the ledger, you can't undo that. You can't delete it. You can't update it. You can append new transactions to the ledger. You can read what's already there. That's it. It's got digital signatures built in. So this isn't uh, an identity layer, but it's a good proxy for identity, usually. So you, you have to sign every transaction that you write to the ledger, and you can be confident that if the signatures match, then two ledger entries were written by the same entity. It's actually not quite that clear, but it's, it's a reasonable rule of thumb. There's usually a degree of programmability built in. Uh, you can do something other than just write to the ledger. Um, and finally, and most interestingly, there is a fair solution to the consensus problem. And that's something I want to dig into in a little bit more detail. So distributed consensus is about everybody agreeing who did what and when. And for us, that's easy. We have a shared objective reality. We all agree what happened and in what order. But that's not the case for distributed computer systems. Sorry, I think my mic's falling off. Um, if you're a computer, you only have access to your own inputs and outputs, and that's particularly problematic for a company server which is locked inside the company's little information bubble. It cares about its own events. It doesn't care about anybody else's events. So it then becomes very hard in a distributed system to know what order events happened in. And that can matter because if you are, let's say, running an auction system, it's really important to know which bid arrived before the other bid. If you have a market with rapidly changing prices, you need to know, did I buy my stuff before the price changed or afterwards? And the, the, the answer to that question makes a big difference. Um, and so what that means is, in a distributed information system, the decision maker, the person or the entity that decides on the order of things, has some power. And traditionally, um, or in practice, there are three main solutions to how we actually solve this problem. And the first solution is kind of cheating. It's saying, OK, we have a distributed system, but we're actually going to centralize this ordering function. And that's what you tend to find in uh, stock exchanges, for example. And so we end up with high-frequency traders, uh, companies who will pay hundreds of millions of dollars to get their computers into buildings that are just a little bit closer to the central exchange, so that even though the transactions are traveling at the speed of light, the fact that they have a few meters less to get to the exchange and back gives companies enough of an advantage that it's worth paying this huge amount of money. And so in this solution to the problem, you have a central node, and the central node essentially has all the power. You can influence the outcome of the system. Now, another approach to this um, is the approach that Google take which is to spend an awful lot of time and money and effort building a system that is clever enough to figure out what happened when. And what I mean by that is Google have these data centers all over the world, and in each one of these, uh, they have an atomic clock that runs at insane accuracy. And they've spent a lot of time and effort and money very carefully measuring the time it takes information to travel between locations, such that um, 
if, let's say, uh, you are editing a Google document and you're collaborating with somebody on the other side of the world and you're both typing away, Google can work out who pressed which key first, even if the packets that represent those bits of information arrive out of sequence at the data center. And that's great. Um, and that works really well for Google, who can afford to build this stuff and run it. So rather than having a centralized node, we still have a centralized entity in control of the consensus system. But it's who owns the synchronization system. And the other major problem with this as a solution is it's incredibly expensive. So if you're not Google, too bad. You probably can't afford to do it. And then we have blockchains. Now, blockchains take a completely different approach to this. And the way this works is that you still centralize the decision about which transactions go into block, but you keep moving the center. So every single block on, let's say, the Bitcoin blockchain is assembled by a randomly selected node on the distributed network. And this gives you a very interesting set of properties because we now, for the first time, have an affordable, extremely trustworthy solution to consensus. But anybody can, can play. You can't realistically control this aspect of the Bitcoin network. You can pay a lot of money and run an awful lot of nodes and you get to um, more of the time than other people control which transactions go into the block, but that isn't really necessarily that useful. You, know, you can't control everything all the time in the way that you can if you have a central node, for example. So what that means is you get these, these properties of uncensorability. If I'm the central node in, um, let's say, the stock exchange, then theoretically I can reject transactions from people I don't like. Or I can preferentially pretend I read, I received some transactions before others if I like this entity more than that one. And with blockchains, you can't do any of that. Now I want to take a sort of sideways step um, and talk a bit about history. And I want to talk about the history of the internet. And there's a perspective on this um, that we like to, to talk about at Materium, where we think about the three ages of the internet. And the first is the internet of ideas. And this is uh, going back to the very beginnings of what we now call the internet in the early to mid-1970s, when people were inventing the protocols that everything is built on. And this is things like TCP IP for moving packets around and connecting computers together, uh, FTP for moving files around, SMTP for sending emails. And this was great, and this ran from about the mid-70s up to the end of the 80s. And at this point, the internet um, was almost entirely academic institutions, not-for-profit organizations, moving information around, sharing mostly quite technical documents, files. So it was nerds, people like me. And that's great, but then in 1991, Tim Berners-Lee at CERN invents HTTP and HTML and basically gives birth to the modern web. And suddenly the internet is more or less easy enough to use for normal people. You no longer have to be a nerd. So mid-90s, uh, the internet starts kind of ramping up, becoming more and more popular. Normal people turn up, and they want to do normal people things, including shopping. But you kind of can't, because it's not safe to send your credit card over the internet at this point. So what tended to happen is that if you wanted to buy something on the internet, you might place your order online, but you'd pay for it out of band. You'd pay for it off the internet. So you'd post somebody a check, or you'd phone them up and give them your credit card details, that kind of thing. And then in uh, the mid-90s, we added just enough encryption to make credit card transactions safe-ish. And we've got the internet of shopping. So secure sockets layer to make HTTPS work means that your connection to the server is encrypted. Um, and now you can actually use your credit card online. And then we get uh, companies like Amazon where you send them some money and they send you some stuff. 
eBay, where you send them some money, they send some of it to somebody else, and that person sends you some stuff. You send Netflix some money, they show you some stuff. And if you're a business, you've got companies like Google and Facebook, where you give them a ton of money and they send you some customers. And this is more or less taking us up to about now-ish. So 20 years or so, um, you can do an awful lot of stuff online that has commercial value. Uh, by some estimates, it's added about $1 trillion to global GDP over those 20 years. But it's entirely credit cards. It's all about transactions. And in a way, that's, that's really not very surprising, because the web is kind of transaction-shaped, if you like. You've got your client computer talking to the server, saying, hey, send me a page. OK, here's a page. It's very much transactional interaction. And for credit cards, that's great. But credit cards represent about 1% of global GDP, all the credit cards spend in the entire world. So for the other 99%, this really isn't that great. Because a lot of the other 99% isn't transactions, it's agreements. So if you think about something like um, entering into a mortgage agreement, which can take you about 25 years to pay off, now who knows what's going to happen to the company that you started that agreement with in 25 years. 25 years ago from today, the internet was a very, very different place. An awful lot of companies that just aren't there anymore. So you need something that's a different shape if you want to do something with the rest of global trade, the rest of global commerce. And so we have this concept at Materium called the Internet of Agreements. And we think this is kind of where we're entering into now. And largely that's because, uh, or partly that's because, if, if the web is transaction-shaped, if the web is shaped like shopping, then blockchains are shaped like agreements. Because you have this very long-running, persistent system. You can't turn off Bitcoin. It's even been written about uh, by Ralph Merkel, even likened it to a life form. So you have a persistent store for your transactions. It's inherently multi-party, so the digital signatures aspect of blockchains um, is a really good fit for this. And you've got some conditionality. So the programmability of the blockchain is a really good fit for setting up the kind of uh, multi-party agreements that an awful lot of global trade is built upon. And I want to talk a little bit about programmability. So I said that um, all blockchains have some, and that's true. Um, and if you look at the Bitcoin blockchain, there is a scripting language. It's very, very limited. And basically, with Bitcoin, you can say, how many coins are there? Where are they? Who owns them? How do they move around? And that works really, really, really well. And Bitcoin, um, and actually no blockchain, has ever actually been hacked. There have been a lot of famous hacks. None of them have been actually the underlying chain. And considering that uh, the last time I read an article about this, they were talking about a $40 billion bug bounty for hacking Bitcoin, it's not because nobody's tried. And as with everything else in the blockchain space, that figure is now out of date by, about, by a factor of about 10. So it's now a $400 billion bug bounty. Then if you look at other blockchains like Ethereum, you can code almost any computer program you can imagine on the Ethereum blockchain. Not quite any, but almost any uh, program can run on the EVM. So you have um, blockchains storing huge amounts of values and the ability to write a program, huge amount of value, sorry, and the ability to write a program that will, uh, scary, scary microphone stuff. Sorry about this. Nah, it's fine. It should be all right. Just let me know if I, if I cut out and go silent, because um, that would be embarrassing. So you can, you can write programs that move money around. Now, we call these programs smart contracts, which is a terrible name, because they're neither smart nor are they contracts. Uh, but we're stuck with it. These tend to be usually relatively small bits of code that you store on the blockchain itself that can do all sorts of things. 
Um, they can store data on the blockchain. They can move tokens around. Um, like I said, more or less anything. Now, trouble with software programs is they have bugs. And in the space of internet programming, web application programming, we kind of don't care. So Facebook famously had this phrase, move fast and break things. And you can get away with that when you're writing a web application. So you write the application, you deploy it, there's a problem, your website's down for a couple of hours, you frantically code up a fix, you deploy that, everything comes back up, everybody's happy. And that's great. Smart contracts don't work like that. So not only can you not update the smart contract once you've written it, but a single mistake on a smart contract can have the effect of moving or losing millions of dollars of value. And this isn't theoretical. So in 2015, when we had the DAO, which was like the first famous really high profile smart contract that went massively wrong, um, somebody stole, I think at the time it was about $135 worth of ether. God knows what that's worth now. Worth now. Then you had uh, other famous high profile hacks, have been things like uh, the Parity multisig wallet, where they had a bug where anybody could take ownership of your wallet, so somebody did and they stole $6 million, and then a bunch of white hat hackers had to go and hack it and deliberately steal the rest preemptively and then give it back to people so that other people didn't. And then they released a new version of the contract which hilariously had another bug where somebody managed to accidentally kill the entire thing and lock up, I think at the time, about $125 million. So, smart contracts require very different engineering practices to the sort of move fast and break things approach we take on the web. This isn't writing, con this isn't writing web applications, this is more like writing the software for a space mission. One mistake, everything crashes and burns, and the whole project is toast. So, things need to change. And they need to change if we want to unlock the potential that we talked about for blockchains to revolutionize global trade. Because you can think of, um, you can think of a contract as a set of promises and obligations. We come to an agreement that says, I promise to do this, and if I do that, then you're obliged to do this. I promise to sell you my house, um, you're obliged to give me a bunch of money. And that's great. Um, obviously, physical property doesn't fit onto a blockchain. You can only put certain things on the blockchain. But one of those is a contract. You can absolutely put a contract on a blockchain. We've talked about the standards of software engineering you need to have if you want to do that kind of thing. And the other piece of this puzzle is dispute resolution. Because let's say we did enter into an agreement and I sell you my house on the blockchain and you pay me in Bitcoin. And then I say, thank you very much, and I refuse to move out. So you then take your smart contract to your lawyer, uh, to the judge, and say, hey, look, I've got this smart contract. It says, you know, here's where it says transfer funds. I did that bit, and here's where it says relinquish ownership. And he did that bit. So why can't I move into this house? And the judge is going to look at this and go, smart what? Bitcoin what? Now, that isn't true. They will, there is a process by which courts will figure out how to understand things they don't understand yet. Uh, they'll bring in experts, the other side will bring in their experts. This all kind of works, but it's incredibly expensive and it's incredibly slow. Um, and we need a way to solve this. But fortunately, blockchain companies are not the only situation in which you get these complicated legal disputes. So maritime law, for example, if you have uh, a container ship taking TVs from Shenzhen to Brazil, and the ship's flying a Panamanian flag, but it's actually owned by a consortium out of Greece, whose members live in the UK and Dubai and Amsterdam, and it's in port in Cape Town, and there's a problem and it sinks. Big legal mess, who sues whom, under which country's law? And trying to figure that out would be ridiculous. It's a nightmare. So we don't do it like that. Instead, we use alternative dispute resolution systems. Now, this is where, I, there. This is really iffy. 
Um, this is where I have to be very careful because the newest member of Materium is a fantastic Dutch lawyer um, who is in the audience tonight, and she's going to give me a really hard time if I get any of this stuff wrong. So, um, arbitration, and to an extent this applies to some of the other alternative dispute resolution systems, arbitration is kind of like having a synthetic jurisdiction. So we can enter into an agreement and we'll say that for the purposes of this agreement, we'll build our own legal system. We'll say, okay, we have this contract and if anything goes wrong, we will resolve it under UK law and we'll, we'll set the seat of arbitration in Hong Kong and we'll choose arbitrators like this or, in, or we could say we'll choose these specific people because we know that they understand the problem domain that this contract relates to. And so you have an arbitration panel and they understand exactly what the house sale blockchain dispute thing means and they say, okay, right, here's the rules, you now have to do this. And then you think, okay, well, I don't really care, that's, that's not my country's legal system, why do I have to do what you tell me? And this is where um, this piece of, uh, this is where the um, a legal instrument called the 1958 New York Convention comes in. And this, uh, um, as you might guess, was signed in 1958 um, in New York, and there are currently 157 countries who are signatories to this. And there are about 195 countries in the world, so that's a pretty good hit rate. And what the convention says is, if you come to my country's legal system with a valid arbitration order from one of these binding arbitration panels, we will enforce it. So in the situation where um, I've sold you my house on the blockchain and refused to leave, if that contract had been entered into in this way with binding arbitration, you'd go to an arbitrator who would understand what selling your house on a blockchain actually means, and they'd go, hey, you have to move out. And you could then take that legal, uh, that arbitral order to the court in wherever I happen to live, which in my case is London, and they would go, oh, right, okay, valid arbitral order, right, and they will apply force to make me comply, which is what legal systems do at the end of the day. It's, it's the valid application of force. So this sounds great. And on the one hand, we've got blockchains for global trade. On the other hand, we have this thing that we think could work as a dispute resolution mechanism. So how do you tie these two things together? Now, the chief scientist at Materium uh, is a man called Dr. Ian Grigg, who in the 1990s, came up with the concept of a Ricardian contract. And there's a history behind the name that I won't get into. And a Ricardian contract combines computer code and legal code, and it ties it together with hash fingerprints, like everything else on the blockchain. And it allows the legal system to understand what it is that the blockchain is doing and how that relates to assets, physical property, whatever, which means it extends the power of the blockchain to all sorts of other kinds of assets. Property, intellectual property, all sorts of things. And finally, I'm getting to what we do at Materium, because this is what we do. We create Ricardian contracts um, that combine legal contracts and smart contracts. So we, have, we exist kind of at the interface of law and technology. We write these contracts using uh, binding arbitration and other dispute resolution mechanisms, and we are in the process of, of training arbitrators in all of the major centers of arbitration around the world so that you have people who actually understand this stuff and can make these rulings. Based in London, which traditionally has been kind of a world center for arbitration because um, of the maritime history. It doesn't have to be, this doesn't have to be um, tied to London, doesn't have to be tied to Ethereum for that matter. And we have legally enforceable blockchain contracts running right now. This stuff actually does work. Thank you very much.
like this smart contract is like writing a, a software for a space station. If it goes wrong, it all crashes and burns. Okay, hello. <laughs> it's better. Yeah. So um, I was intrigued by your uh, um, by, by your nice quote about uh, uh, smart contracts writing is like writing software for space missions, and if it goes wrong, everything crashes and burns. And um, I, I would like to know from you if if there's any progress on that. Like, can can you? For instance, in a way, test if a smart contract is well written or if there's a there might be an error in it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, is this on? Yes, it is on. Um, yes is the short answer. You absolutely can. Um, so, so there are lots of, of software practices that you can put into place to absolutely minimise the chance that your contract doesn't do what you think it's going to do. So on the, the sort of the building side of things, um, it's, you've got similar best practices to the best practices we have for writing programs for the web or for any other domain. So test-driven development, domain-driven design. Um, you write the, the tests for the behavior of your contract first. So the approach that we're, we're looking at now is for the legal contract, um, so there's an approach called literate programming, which is uh, kind of where you, you have the description of the program co-located with the actual code. And the approach we're looking at to do that kind of thing is to have cl contract clauses, and then in the same file above those would be the definitions of the tests that you expect to pass if that contract has been correctly encoded in your contract. And that's great for confirming what it is that your contract does. Does my contract do the thing that I think it does? Which is part of the problem, but it's not all of the problem, because the other side of the problem is, does my contract not do things I don't want it to do? And that's where all the bugs are. And so to try and minimize this, the chances of doing that, um, you can, for certain blockchain languages, you can use sort of formal verification methods. Um, you also potentially can use things like fuzzing, where you, you randomly generate vastly more scenarios than a human could possibly come up with, no matter how weird, because it's a machine doing it, and that can do anything you want, and you throw all of those at, your, at the object under test and see what it does. Um, and the other piece of the puzzle is that we will not release any smart contract to any client um, until they have commissioned an independent audit from somebody that we trust to be competent to actually do this. So this is kind of a, a three-pronged approach to try and minimize the chances of anything getting out into the wild that isn't 100% safe. Uh, we have some other approaches to minimize the problem, which I kind of can't talk about because we're filing patents. Um, but those, that's the ones I can talk about. Sorry, I didn't see which questions. Okay, I'm here. Hi there. Um, how do you handle identity? Mm -hmm. Because I am so glad you asked me that. Identity, it, it, it's either it's on the blockchain. Yeah. And what do the legal guys think of that? And you need it in order to enforce the the uh, the contract, I presume. Yes. Okay. We think it's a mess. Uh, is what we think of identity on the blockchain. Um, it's a hugely complicated and misunderstood area. And it's one of the fundamental underpinnings of all of this stuff. So we really kind of need to get that right. Um, and one of the reasons I'm glad you asked me about that is we were actually organizing a conference um, in April, um, which is um, the third Internet of Agreements conference focusing entirely on identity. And an approach that, um, that we're interested in in this area uh, is something that our CEO Vinay Gupta describes as bash it flat until it looks like money. And what we mean by that is, I'm not talking about legal identity. So the degree to which your nation state has to make you verify that you are who they think you are is a, is a kind of a separate thing. But in commercial terms, you can think about identity as a kind of risk. 
So if I enter into a transaction with you, um, and obviously we're talking about sort of transactions where I can't necessarily see you. I mean, you know, we're right here, but um, on the blockchain in the digital realm, I probably can't. You're probably miles away. So you can think about identity risk rather than identity as an absolute concept, a concept. And so if I'm entering into a transaction with somebody on the internet, what I really want to protect myself against is the risk that they're not actually a Nigerian prince. And that's a quantifiable risk. And it's an insurable risk. So an approach that we're looking at is identity insurance. So I have a long-standing relationship with my insurer. They are pretty confident they know who I am. They're so confident they're willing to put money on the barrel head and say, yep, we're pretty sure this person is who they say they are. Which means that if you enter into a contractual arrangement, you're protected against me not being who I say I am. Because if it turns out that I'm not who I say I am, you get paid by somebody whose job it is to make darn sure that they know who I am. So this is an approach that we're, we're um, talking about right now. Um, it's not a full solution to the identity problem, but for commercial purposes, it could have a lot of merit. Thanks for the nice presentation and uh, explaining the concept. You said in one of your last slides that you're running contracts now. Can you disclose maybe some information about what kind of companies are already into doing this kind of new stuff? Uh, in vague and general terms, yes. Um, so the, the thing that you can, you can download and play with is our proof of concept app called EtherCam. And EtherCam is, um, is a photography app with built-in contracts for licensing the intellectual property rights of the works that you create with it. Um, the kinds of companies who are using our services, I can't, sorry, there isn't that much I can talk about. Um, uh, investment funds are, are very interested. Um, and yeah, that really is kind of the only thing I can kind of say. I'm sorry about that. Uh, it's all a bit commercially sensitive. If you ask me in a month, we'll have more stuff launched and we can talk about it and make a big noise about it on our, on our website. <laughs>